Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Rajan Chochki on data analytics for artificial lift and production engineers. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the democratic dem demographics of the audience. So I will launch the poll. And the first question is how many years of full-time experience do you have? Responses are coming in now. Looks like we have uh, quite a few people with more than 20 years experience. The majority of you are in the 11 to 20 year range. We're still getting votes. Okay, most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. 58% uh, are in the 11 to 20 year range, followed by 25% with 21 to 30 years. So let's go to our next polling question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in production and specifically artificial lift? Let's see how many artificial lift experts we have out there. Looks like most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close this poll. The majority are in the zero to five year range, 75, 79%. So actually quite a few of you in that zero to five year range. And we have one more question. And what has been your experience with machine learning techniques? And again, this is a years of experience question. And we're getting quite a few of you in the less than five year category. Okay, looks like most have voted. So I'll go ahead and close that poll. And the results are that 50% have less than five years in machine learning, 21% uh, less than one year, and 29% none. So this will be a great opportunity for all of you. So uh, before I introduce uh, Rajan Chochki, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, you are muted in today's webinar, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the go to webinar question feature and we will cover those questions at the end of the presentation so be sure and type them as you think of them so uh, dr shoshki has had a uh, varied career he's uh, worked in academia he's worked for an operator he's worked in a well-filled service company and, and has a variety of experiences in teaching and consulting and he's going to share some of that knowledge today He's widely published and he's been very active in SPE. Uh, Dr. Shoshki teaches a number of courses for SCA. Uh, there are several topics listed here. They can be teached as, taught as standalone courses or they can be combined for a custom course if you'd like to have it offered in-house. Uh, we have a public course scheduled for March 7th through 9th in Midland, Texas. This course is on artificial lift and real-time optimization for unconventional assets. So if you're in Midland, you might want to sign up for that course uh, coming up very soon. And uh, here's some contact information if you would like to call us about uh, training courses and how to do something in-house or what public courses we might have scheduled. Um, this is part of our free webinar series. Um, in February, we actually have two webinars scheduled. Uh, Dr. Steven Sonneberg will be teaching um, a course and he's gonna give us a, a webinar on geologic carbon capture, utilization and storage. And Bob Barbet will be doing a webinar um, later in February on the top 10 reasons to refrack organic shale wells with results from Eagleford and Haynesville case studies. So be sure and sign up for those two webinars. And don't forget to choose SCA when you're thinking about training, consulting, 
projects and studies and direct higher resources. We're happy to help you. So I will pass the presentation rights to you, Rajan. Okay. And I'll let you start your presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon or good day. Uh, so, am I showing the presentation? Yes, okay. it looks good. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone, uh, and thanks for joining today's uh, webinar. Uh, this topic uh, of data analytics grew out of my, uh, as I was developing and giving talk on digital oil field uh, two, three years ago uh, with SPE. I uh, had a chance to talk with uh, lots of practicing engineers uh, around the globe. And then I was, I've been uh, working with um, a technology company for the last several years and I had a chance to work with uh, quite a few uh, data analytics people and I thought that uh, it's a good idea that uh, we have some discussion that is relevant for artificial and to some extent production engineers. I also gave a similar webinar under SPE so some of you may have attended that. Um, or not. Um, I also presented a two-day school uh, with Artificial Lift Research and Development Council, and that was focused specific specifically on gas lift. So this uh, talk is uh, geared more towards uh, all the artificial lift methods. And if we look at uh, the presentation outline, my thought is just to share with you some of the ideas on what is this digital transformation and where does uh, analytics fit in within it? Uh, I'll give some of the examples um, after giving you some very broad brush strokes of this machine learning and artificial intelligence space. And then we'll have some conclusion and question answer. This is such a fast evolving area that it is very likely that some of you may have uh, exposure to or learned about uh, the application that I'm not covering. But the examples that I have chosen <clears throat> that are all published in examples available in the literature. Um, and the class that I will be teaching based on this topic with SCA uh, would cover some more examples based out of my private practice, as well as it will be more hands-on type of uh, class uh, whereby people will have a chance to look at and work with actual data sets and develop some models and so on and so forth. So coming back to um, the topic at hand, uh, the analytics and digital transformation has been uh, kind of talked about, particularly digital transformation. If you go back to some of the 2010 presentation from SPE GCS section, and there were companies like Shell, BP, and so on, they self reported how much of improvement they were getting out of digital. Uh, oil field at the time we used to say digital oil field related activities and uh, the projected benefits were substantial as you can see on the left side here. Uh, last uh, couple of years ago, uh, JPT also had uh, how uh, had some articles on how digital transformation is adding up to billions at BP and uh, how the other operators are digitalizing and such. So I went back to uh, SPE's website, JPT's website, particularly the way ahead, um, and that is more geared towards the young professionals and maintained and written. There are many articles written by young professionals. And as you can see that uh, 
there is a there, there's a lot of interest in this topic how do i change my career or how do i have a career kick start or what type of technology skill sets do i need in order to get into this uh, field of um, very exciting and hot field of um, data analytics in a sense there is a lot of fomo and for fear of missing out as well as fear uncertainty and doubts on top of it uh, when you go and start googling or start talking to people there are lots of acronyms that get thrown at you and uh, in general whenever i talk to anybody the sense that i capture is for fear uncertainty and doubt and people have this sense of getting lost my objective here is to give you some of my learnings um, without going wading through all the other things but before we do that let's talk about digital oil field because that is the bedrock of analytics and everything so when you look at the digital oil field progression it always starts with the surveillance monitoring and diagnostics unless you measure you don't know what's going on and there you're looking at a variety of sensors and then there's a connectivity uh, to the field office to corporate office uh, to partners vendors and such and there are a variety of dashboards some of the people stop at this and call that analytics right basically they throw some data into spot fire or even excel and variety of visualization tools and they say that yeah that is analytics that is indeed a part of the analytics but that is not the whole story so once you have the surveillance framework in place then the next step is analyzing and this is where um, the things get really interesting sometimes even uh, confusing and also complex where people talk about workflows they talk about centralizing the control um, smart alarms and such but this is not uh, as easy it is easier said than done this part right and that's where our journey on the analytics start then comes optimization intervention and control in real time where we can adjust the production based on some real-time data that is streaming. And the value starts coming in when we do some predictive and preventative actions, particularly on the maintenance side of it. Um, and then comes the using some of the, and by the way, this predictive and preventative maintenance, as well as some of these workflows, there's a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence is going on. But the expectation is that eventually this, this will lead us to some of the autom autonomous operations, integrated asset management, and there is also some fear about demanding aspect of it. But in my opinion, it's not demanding as much as upscaling yourself. And I hope uh, today's talk will give you some pointers in that direction. So before we jump into that, um, I'm assuming that most of us would like to identify ourselves as SMEs, even though quite a few of you say you have less than five years of experience, which is substantial in my mind. So when you look at the role of subject matter expert or SME versus the role of a data scientist, then SMEs are more domain focused. They know how the things work in the field, what type of data is available, what are the limitations on the data, which is a good data or bad data. And they understand the business side of it. What is the business value? Uh, by putting this data to some use, what kind of value you can derive? On the other hand, data scientists, they're very well versed in the methodologies, workflows related to the data science they have learned all the pieces uh, they have learned about the machine learning algorithms uh, how to implement them in the setup in the computer setup and such and they also can tell us about whether the model is good or not 
or when the model becomes uh, stable. Okay, my role in today's my goal in today's talk is not to tell you how to become a data scientist or how to develop machine learning skills. I'm I'm not one, but there are some good resources and free resources available out on the web, and uh, the Coursera's uh, uh, machine learning courses are a good start. And there are some free online machine learning curriculum uh, also, and so on. And once you start going on that, then how do you go through your learning roadmap? And there are plenty of resources out there. And that often causes also lots of fun, uh, in my opinion. But again, as I said, I'll not uh, spend any time on it. My expectation is that when most of us would be working in any machine learning or AI project, we will have experts, we will have some data scientists who will make the appropriate judgment calls on the procedures, workflows, uh, modeling methodologies related to the data analytics. Now, one another thing that we have to keep in mind, uh, and that has to do with this fear factor, that machine learning code or AI code, it is a very, very small part of the overall system. And this uh, figure I have taken from a paper published by Google. Uh, in the bottom, you have um, the authors who have published this paper. Well, but the, the takeaway, very important takeaway is that when you look at the overall infrastructure related to any machine learning system or any AI system, then the code, the machine learning code is a very small aspect of it. The big aspect is data, data collection, data verification, configuration, how that data funnels into the system. Uh, what, which parts of the data are useful towards the machine learning, what is called feature extraction. And then there are some analytical tools and process management tools. And then there is a big uh, box here, how this machine learning model gets delivered. That is what is the servicing infrastructure. And then how do you monitor? So there are lots of pieces. But to remove that fear factor, I want to point out one thing that machine learning code itself is very small. In my opinion, as an SME, and this topic, again, I'll come back again in a minute, that as SMEs, we should be focused more on the data side of it. So when you look at the overall life cycle of any machine learning or AI project, it always starts with this business need, revenue. I like. So in business needs, there are always some higher level stakeholders who will be asking you questions about dollars and cents. They will have some concerns about the infrastructure and such. And then as an SME, you articulate that vision that what, what is the business need and what can be done about it. Then comes the data preparation. That's where, again, as an SME, you work with some of the uh, data analytics people, as well as your automation group and such, focus on what are the acquisition side of it, where from the data is coming, whether the data can be pre-processed or it needs to be pre-processed, it needs to be labeled or not, whether it needs to be split into multiple data sets. These are all the tasks related to data preparation. Again, as an SME, you have an important role to play in this. Then comes developing the model. And this is the domain that is best left to the data scientists, where they work on feature engineering, experimentation, evaluation, comparison. And then after all of that is done, they say, okay, here is a model or an ensemble or a collection of models that seem to solve this particular business case the best uh, within the bounds of the available data. And then comes the group IT and computer science uh, people who will figure out what type of what type of infrastructure that needs to be put in place so that this model is served up where it starts being used, right? 
So as you can see, this dialog model, server model, as an SMB, we may not have to, uh, we may not have much input. But then comes retraining the model. How the model is actually performing in the real life scenario? Is it drifting? Is the data, is the new data available? You know, the performance is going bad. Uh, do we have some change of the boundary conditions so that uh, we need to maybe go back and retrain the model? And that's where, again, as an SME, we have an important role to play. So as you can see, out of this five-step process, cycle process, and there are many, many more sub-steps within it, but at higher level, out of these five phases, if I may say, as an SME, we have an important role to play in these three steps, or three phases. Right. One thing we have to also keep in mind that 80% of the work and frustration comes during this stage. Data preparation, developing and defining a good business need. Whereas the 80% of the project risk comes during this developing the model and serving the model. So this is something uh, that we have to keep in mind as we embark on this journey of machine learning. AI application in the, not only artificial, but actually it is applicable in any domain. That as a subject matter expert, what data, what business need that I'm satisfying? What data do I need? And how do I keep an eye on those models that are developed or not? Now, when you look at the machine learning or uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence workflows. Um, at a high level, uh, it is very much the same. So the first part in the data preparation, you basically collect the data records, you sort the data records, you establish minimum maximum value, you figure out are there any outliers, should they be thrown out or should they be kept in, uh, keep the normalized values and divide the data records into training and testing the data set. That is a very high level workflow when we talk about the data preparation. By the way, this figure I have uh, borrowed from this particular paper, and I'll come back to this paper again and again, a couple of times at this more. Then once you have done the data preparation, the developing the model part is as I said earlier, typically done with the people who have background or experience in the data sciences, where they choose the input variable, they figure out what are the features, there. they try different machine learning or deep learning algorithms, figure out what are the errors, figure out which is the best, select, which is the best machine learning or deep learning method that minimizes this prediction error. So this is, a, as I say, high level data preparation and model development workflow. With that, now let me switch gears. Now that we have a lay of the land, let's look at uh, production engineering and artificial web systems specifically. Which are the problems that are being addressed actively? And they, are, they fall in this category of anomaly detection, failure prediction, and virtual flow metering. So one thing we have to keep in mind is that for the production engineers, our data loops are very fast. We are more tactical in nature. So as is shown uh, in this figure from Saeed Mubarak's uh, paper from some time ago, 2008, when you look at when you are directly dealing with devices and machines, then you are talking in terms of seconds and hours. Whereas when you are looking at modeling and simulation at the lower level, then you are looking at weeks, months, and years type of time scale, right? So what we are talking about is that the data that we would be dealing with would have higher frequency in terms of the time. That is one thing. So with that brief background, let's talk about anomaly detection. Anomaly is basically any discrepancy or deviation from the what is considered a normal behavior. Now this deviation uh, could be indicative of an impending failure or uh, a defect or a change in some input parameter that have not been tracked. So anomaly detection uh, could be a very, very important uh, um, area 
that we can apply uh, in many aspects of the work we do as artificial lift engineers. Right. And traditionally in the data analytics, what we do uh, using the statistical methods, we figure out what are the magnitudes of a variable which is being observed. What is the signature of the data event? Uh, with what periodicity that value is repeating? And then we figure out uh, the trend and figure out uh, whether this value has deviated from what is considered normal behavior or not. When it comes to the machine learning side of it, uh, there are quite a few unsupervised learning techniques um, uh, that can be deployed for that. And this is uh, the area uh, that would be of, uh, in my opinion, significant interest because as an artificial lift uh, engineers or operators, we often keep an eye on high, high, low, low. And what are those high, high, low, low areas? Basically, we are looking at the anomalies. Similarly, we might be interested in looking at when my well or when my ESP is not performing within uh, the operating range that is device mode. So that is all part of the anomaly detection. Now here, I'm showing you one example of a North Sea gas lift well. And uh, this uh, is a rather complex figure. And what you're looking at on the left side are some of the conventional uh, log uh, data set. But in the middle and the right side of the figure, what you are looking at are the distributed acoustic sensing data set that is captured from the same gas as well. And on the right side, we are looking at uh, the same uh, data, uh, but uh, zoomed in over a specific time period. An objective of this exercise, analytics exercise, is to figure out do we have a leaky gas lift valve? In this particular case, and by the way, if you're interested, this particular one hour long video is available on YouTube. Um, this exercise tries to figure out whether the gas lift valve is leaky or it is uh, a packer is leaking. And uh, by looking at the signatures here, uh, the analyst visually examining this uh, uh, data and it comes up with the conclusion that we have a leaky gas lift bomb. Now, what is being done? Traditionally, the analyst would spend close to several hours and this decision needs to be made very quickly because you cannot have work over waiting there on the site as this data is remaining. And that is where the value of some of this new generation vision-based machine learning system wise because the vision-based machine learning system they can detect this type of anomaly very quickly that normally when there is no leak then there won't be any such signature coming up like this right and that is where um, uh, typically when people talk about vision-based artificial intelligence system they talk about how to identify cats and dogs and such from the pictures we can apply the same technique here, how to identify the change in this color scheme, which is indicative of the flow rate and such. Here is another uh, sample uh, paper, um, STE paper uh, that I picked up from. What they did was they used a distributed temperature sensing data to detect the anomaly. In this particular case, they wanted to figure out do we have multi point injection going on or not. And using uh, this distributed temperature, temperature sensing data, and they use a variety of uh, unsupervised learning methodologies here. Um, and for you might be, if you have been exposed, unsupervised is where the algorithm tries to detect what is an abnormal behavior without being told what an abnormal behavior looks like. Versus the supervised learning, supervised learning requires somebody to go in and label the data that hey here this is an indicative of a gas lift valve open or close in this particular case what i'm showing here is that using the distributed temperature sensing data the kind that is being shown here they are trying to uh, determine uh, whether the which valve is active or not and here is an example of what is called some clustering technique being used 
where the walls that are open, they cluster in one part of the subspace or parametric subspace. The walls that are closed, they cluster in a different part of the parametric subspace. And there are some iffy conditions also. So using this type of algorithm, it becomes very easy to quickly identify uh, whether the wall is open or closed, or do we have multi-point injection going on? So this example, earlier we used to rely on somebody to look at uh, a temperature log to figure out whether there is a multi-point injection going on or not. Now, visualize if you are dealing with some unconventional wells where there are large slurs of uh, gas and liquid that comes from the reservoir because of the long lateral, meaning sometimes the upper wall may open or close depending upon the wall setting. So if you have a system like this, then it can give you this type of diagnosis on many magnetic basis. Uh, as the DTS reading comes in, it can immediately tell you at what point. Uh, the wall is open or closed. So this is another example of an away detection. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, in the ESP area also, the anomaly detection is very, very important. And here is an example from a paper that was published late, um, like year before last, where they have developed some real-time automated detection framework. And the idea there is more of a pattern recognition, as what we are looking at here are there are motor temperature, discharge pressure, intake pressure, dry frequency, and motor current values. And looking at all of the signatures of different uh, five parameters that are coming in, it is trying to identify, the algorithm is trying to identify that whether there is a uh, gas interference going on, or there is a insufficient lift going on. And here is another example of how they are using a clustering technique to figure out there's a gas interference or normal behavior, or so on and so forth. So uh, this is uh, now we did have some systems that were doing some statistics based pattern recognition, and those systems are still in use uh, around the globe. Uh, so this is uh, another way of approaching the same problem of detecting uh, anomalous behavior of ESP using some machine learning techniques. Right? And uh, again, uh, for those of you who are interested, please refer to this SP paper, and there are quite a few more. And here is another uh, SP paper that lays out the failure prediction. As we all know, in case of ESP, the failures uh, can mean considerable amount of deferred production because ESP wells are typically high producers. Not only that, you have to plan for the rates which may or may not be available readily meaning your well will be down. And that's where many of the operators having substantial ESP well inventory have focused on this particular space, meaning figuring out failure prediction. So in this paper, they have developed a supervised learning approach and they can that, okay, random forest space classifier, uh, help them figure out uh, uh, the failure in advance. And as uh, this figure shows that, that the data-driven models capture 58% of well failures and 66% of home failures while keeping all false and unmanageable. This part is very, very important, not to generate the false alarm, because if we generate too many false alarms, then operator, the person who is watching the system, may lose the interest or may lose the trust in the system. Now, uh, these numbers, some people may say that they are not that high precision numbers, but keep in mind, there are so many variables that goes into it, depending upon what features you have extracted or how you applied. Uh, this may not be, uh, this may or may not be uh, as good. 
uh, but uh, in my opinion, uh, this is a very good number. Uh, again, I have looked at quite a few such use cases, particularly in this area, and there is not a common answer. This is another thing I wanted to share with you. That in this particular case, they use random forest. Another SV paper that I showed on the ESP a while ago, um, those authors have presented some reinforcement learning based approach. So my recommendation is that don't just get fixated with one particular method. Apply your data with multiple of those models and that's where your data scientist colleagues come. Very, very, they, they are very helpful. Develop an ensemble of model. Uh, as your data quantity increases, then look at uh, the uh, deep learning technologies because um, for higher quantity of the data, deep learning models are expected to perform a lot better compared to the traditional machine learning methodologies like random forest and such. This is not an endorsement of deep learning or machine learning methodology. This is just what has been observed. Okay, uh, pattern recognition. Uh, again, uh, there is uh, this uh, paper from Peter Bankert um, on predictive maintenance for art forms. And what they have uh, done is they have basically used the, uh, and we do not have enough time to go into all of these uh, details, but basically they looked at about 300 levels, 36,000, close to 36,000 cards. And in that case, they use a stochastic gradient boosted decision tree model. And they claim accuracy of almost 99.9% with even distribution of errors. And uh, they have used all of this labeled uh, uh, the, the diameter cards that are labeled with this particular events. And they came up with a model set that gave them 99.9% accuracy. Now, does it mean that with your data set, you will get similar results using stochastic gradient boosted decision tree model? Maybe, maybe not. And that's where there's a lot of experimentation work that is required. If you recall in the previous slide, I say, 80% of the project risk is during those data science experimentation work, and 80% of the delays are during the data capture work. Now, let me switch gears and go to the virtual flow meter or virtual flow prediction. Uh, that is a very good uh, paper, uh, and a unique part of that uh, paper is that they have published even the entire data set. So, for some of you who already have uh, the exposure to the machine learning method and for some of you who are just cutting your teeth or beginning, I would highly recommend this paper. Um, go there, you can download the entire data set. I do not agree with one of the hypotheses that uh, the data set is comprising of all the critical flow wells, right? Um, so this data set is captured from an offshore well in Iran and uh, from this particular source uh, oil field. And then, and this is a significant number of data set, a number of uh, input variables or the features are relatively small. That's what I like about this data set, that basically we have to diameter, that had pressure, on specific gravity, GLR, and the flow rate. Flow rate is our objective variable in this case. Yeah. So, uh, so using this, they have done the choke flow prediction. And one thing I liked about this paper is that they have really described in detail each and every methodology and which parameters did they select or type of parameters they selected. And here, what you're looking at is that what type of measurement errors that they found. And in their experience, the deep learning models, meaning more than two hidden area type of models, artificial neural network, perform the best. Um, they also tried 
support vector machines. They tried uh, Dishy Country, Random Forest, and of course, a single layer neural network type of model. They also looked at uh, the errors uh, with the traditional approaches like Gilbert, Bexendall, Ross, and so on and so forth. And in each and every case, what they found is their machine learning models always give a lot lower root mean square error compared to this so-called physics-based models. And the deep learning one gives the smallest error for that particular data set. Again, uh, if you're reaching for some action and really want to put your hand on some data set, head over to this particular uh, uh, paper's uh, link or drop me a line afterwards and I'll be able to provide you this link. Uh, so that will be a good exercise to be produced. Okay. Uh, there is this uh, work being done at the University of Tulsa. Uh, uh, on the virtual flow meter for the plunger lift. As we all know, plunger lift is a highly dynamic process. It's a relatively simple artificial lift method. But when you try to solve uh, this, uh, what is the flow rate in the plunger lift well, then you have to basically pay attention to plunger arrival timings. What are the pressures, tubing pressure, casing pressure, line pressures, uh, and also you have to basically use some uh, unsteady state models which are very complex and computationally quite expensive uh, to compute the flow rate right so they used uh, artificial neural network with three hidden layers and ten nodes they figured out that when they use the brute force approach and it just threw everything all the data in the neural network they could not get an acceptable result. But when they use some of the features based on the physics, and this is where the feature engineering comes in, meaning they started looking at the pressure differential and flow rate transformation, then they got this artificial neural network to perform a lot better. Of course, more training data helps to develop a better neural network model. As I said earlier, Neural network models perform better with higher quantity of data. So, in my mind, a main takeaway from this particular exercise is that we need to be very selective about which features we are using, and that is where our knowledge as subject matter expert comes handy. In this particular case, we know that when we look at the traditional fast and ball type of methods in plunger lift, that we look at always the tubing and casing pressure differential, right? So this is what they are referring to here. That rather than using the raw pressure value, when they started using the pressure differential, they got better result. Similarly, if I can take you along with on a mental exercise, if you are doing a virtual flow meter based on the ESP. Right. You can look at the differential pressure across the pump if you have the discharge and intake pressure, or you can look at the differential pressure across the intake and the well head pressure, or you can look at the differential pressure, well head pressure, and the flow line pressure, and so on and so forth. So, if when you come up with some of this physics space engineering feature, then invariably your model's performance will improve. Okay, I'll not uh, go through on uh, this slide. Basically, it shows that how the brute force model predictions are not good compared to the uh, model predictions with an improved feature set. Now, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I, I'm trying to talk, uh, I'm trying to bring up this topic of edge devices. This is another exciting area. As an artificial lift engineer, we rely a lot on the field side controllers. And these controllers, basically what do we do? We set some limits so that the system can be stopped or started depending upon the major values whenever they go beyond those limits. Edge devices, you can think of them as souped up controllers. 
the main difference is that not only they looked at the major parameters, but they looked at the output from some machine learning model. Many these are small computers, very powerful computers. Some of them have a GPUs, graphical processor unit, and variable in. And they can perform detailed calculations. So in this particular case, this SP paper refers to this particular edge device or edge gateway that is installed side by side the traditional Rockcom controller, or in this case, it's a variable speed drive. And how it not only looks at the raw input data of the dynamic card, but then it feeds all of the dynamic card data into this ensemble of the models. I do not have enough time to go into it, but and then there are some specific weight assigned to the prediction from each of these model. And uh, the model gives a particular feedback about the state of the, this particular artificial system, in this case, rock pump, right? And there are, in this case, what they have done is reinforcement learning, meaning that is, or they call it augmented intelligence. So basically, whatever model's output comes in, there is a feedback provided by the expert, and that's where the model learns more. There is some reward being offered to the model when it uh, comes up with a better prediction and such. And as a result of that, this retraining process, as a result of this retraining process, we keep on improving the performance of the models, which are embedded at the well site. So there is nobody sitting in the remote control center. Uh, and I mean, the expectation is that someday this autonomous system will start controlling the behavior of this rod pump, meaning when to start, when to stop, when to generate the hammer and such. So this is uh, uh, the area uh, edge devices. This is where I uh, expect lots of improvement as well as lots of uh, innovations that will be applied in addition to the other uh, systems and uh, models that I talked about earlier. So in conclusion, we can definitely agree that data-driven approaches are increasingly being applied in the artificial deep learning. By the way, the papers that I selected are very few. There are a lot more papers that have been published in the last two, three years, right? Most of the applications cover anomaly detection, failure prediction, um, virtual flow metering. There is significant interest in what is called traveling sales problem also but that is for some other day. Um, but the thing is that the use of machine learning or AI approaches do help in saving time, minimizing the efforts, improving the quality of the decisions, increasing the yield, minimizing the human error, improving the accuracy and lowering the risk. Another interesting outcome of this is lowering the greenhouse gas effect. When we have some of these machine learning models making some decisions that can be accessed remotely and then will not have a need to send somebody out there to check on the things. But again, that is a topic by itself, right? Now here is this one statistic that only about 5% of the data collected is being used with great result. This is one thing. We are capturing lots of data, but we do not have enough analytics. So if you could automate learning for all the collected data, and that is what we can do with machine learning techniques. So our takeaway for the seminar is that the machine learning and AI approaches promises promise new pathways for solving our operational challenges, even design challenges. But we need to, we artificial lift and production community, we need to pay 
attention to the, and participate in this data life cycle all the way from the beginning, from data capture, data cleaning, through modeling, to production deployment and returning. That brings me to the end of this presentation. And uh, now we are open for the questions, Susan. I'd like to remind our audience that you're muted, but you can ask your questions using the question feature in the GoToWebinar platform. We'll cover those questions now. So I have a question. Um, you shared your schematic for the, the cycle of um, different processes. And at the point where you were talking about uh, developing the model and serving the model, you said that represents 80% of the project risk. Uh, how can we mitigate that risk? How, how can we deal with that project risk aspect? Yes, so I think uh, let me bring up uh, that particular slide. Um, I believe we are talking about uh, this and uh, here, uh, we say 80% of the project is the mitigation basically starts at this stage. See, when uh, the features are not properly devised, the models may have a limited value, in my opinion. And until you put the models in the production, you do not find that out. So to mitigate that project risk, we as a subject matter expert, need to focus more on the data, whether the data is clean enough, is the data good, is it uh, reasonable. We, oftentimes, uh, the systems are sending the data, but data could be flatlined, data could be anomalous, uh, it could be out of the ranges, it, uh, the sensors may have drifted. In some cases, even we may have some wrong information. So the data preparation phase, validating and verifying that data can, uh, I would say, then comes the other parts, right? The experimentation. We should ask uh, the data science uh, team that, hey, have we looked at all the possibilities? Uh, have we looked at, um, or are we just uh, stopping at the first, uh, set of models that's it. because sometimes people uh, i mean oftentimes when i talk to uh, some of this uh, project uh, groups they have worked on hundreds in some cases hundreds of thousands of models before deciding on one right so this evaluation and comparison aspect is very very important and people can talk about uh, uh, training versus uh, testing validation and such. Um, so we have to just basically check that, has that task been performed? Next comes the scaling aspect of it. Now again, it is not in our domain, right? There are computer science people and that, but so they have to figure out whether all the pipes and by pipe data pipes are properly laid out. Because when you are developing the models, uh, when you are preparing the data, oftentimes it is more of an offline activity. I mean, you take the extract of the data and work with it, experiment with it. But once you go into the runtime environment, if your data is not coming with the frequency uh, that you were expecting during the model development, or uh, there is a lag, then how do you account for it? One, one example I'll give you is uh, oftentimes most of the assets, your flow rate data doesn't come in until after a well test is done. And that is why lots of people have gone for virtual flow meter phase approaches. Uh, so until and unless your uh, next well test is conducted, you are going to work with some stale information. So can your model, or is your, if your model is sensitive, to the flow rate data, then how do you overcome that? And that goes into this feature engineering side of it, right? Um, I'm, I'm not qualified enough to talk enough about it, but then I would say that once the model goes into the 
uh, pilot phase, implementation phase, then we have to start to thinking about how I would track when that model needs to be taken out of the service, right? This is the full life cycle approach I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, please, uh, I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you. I, I see someone raising their, their hand and I want to remind you, we can't call on you because you're muted in GoToWebinar, but you can type your question into the question box on GoToWebinar. So I have another question. And this relates to the uh, series that you described of surveillance, analysis, optimization, and then innovation. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in some large companies, they may actually have a standard they can use for surveillance, analysis, and optimization. Uh, but how do you standardize innovation? It would seem like, by the very nature, that would be more freeform. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, that's a good point. Um, the state at which we are, uh, it seems that uh, this is a somewhat uh, chaotic or not a well organized process. And it is not uh, unique to our industry, by the way. It is uh, very common across uh, the board and that's why there are some new approaches uh, what is called data ops if you have heard of and so which is a whole group uh, or a set of activities which are formalized related to the data capture data management data distribution and such similarly there is another set of practices which are being grouped under what is called ML ops or machine learning operations, right? And this ML ops and data ops are two sets of groups that focus more on standardizing all the activities related to the life cycle of machine learning and AI models. Coming back to what we can do internal, I think, uh, and when I keep on saying we, I'm referring, I'm assuming that most all of us here are practitioners in the artificial production domain. Um, so from our side, we have to really uh, pay attention to some of the emerging like sensing domain sensors that are coming out and how we can deploy or whether we can deploy and the other part that we can do is this edge devices what edge devices would uh, do in my opinion is that they would uh, help uh, standardize some of the data capture and data processing workflows at the source of data generation near the well site or near um, lift equipment and so on and so forth. Hope that answers your questions. Thank you. You've talked about uh, the ability to predict failure and um, also emission detection. What are the biggest opportunities for improvement in artificial lift? In, in this area of machine learning. Uh, Susan, if you don't mind repeating the part of the, I did not quite capture. Yes, sorry. Let me adjust my mic. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, this is about better. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you talked about failure prediction and you mm -hmm. talked about um, being able to uh, recognize patterns, and you talked about emission detecting. Where do you think are the biggest opportunities for artificial lift uh, using machine learning? The biggest impact. Okay, so the biggest impact, see at the end of the day, the biggest impact would become from two sides. One is uh, employing, keeping the downtime to the minimum, right? Uh, 
And that is where the failure prediction is one aspect of it. I, I think anomaly detection is even a bigger aspect of it because anomalous behavior is indicative of failure, but not necessarily always. But anomalous behavior could, in most cases, would lead to production interruption. So that is where I would look at improving the production efficiency would be the first thing. The second aspect is, I, yes, I did refer to the methane emission and such. That is um, the area, on one hand, we can say that now it is a bigger issue. Like if you look at some of the statistics based on the, uh, I was reviewing uh, this one Permian project site about the data that was captured using aerial surveillances and such. And one of their take, uh, like outcome was that most of the emission that they measured, the samples that they have measured, and they did not one time, multiple times. And in their assessment, that emission was not coming from the well sites that were what they call jet control. I mean, or what is called rod pump control sites. But in their um, observation, the emission related issues were coming because of either the flats were inactive or deficient, or they were not lighting up where they were supposed to light up. That was the major majority. The second majority was coming from facilities also, which was the uh, thief hatch opening. Coming back to specifically artificial lift and methane emission. I think uh, it is uh, like on the rod pump side, we have to focus more on uh, where our rod goes into the vapor board and comes up meaning around the polish rod. What is happening there? Are we allowing something to escape the vapor board? So keeping a, a trend of um, that is one area that we can do from the uh, environmental perspective. When we look at some of the plunger well loading up practices, and, and it used to be that uh, if the well loads up because we did not manage or maintain our plunger cycles properly, then operators used to, and in some parts still they do, vent the well. And that was a leading cause of methane emission applicable to artificial practices. If we apply some of these techniques properly, come up with a good cycle regulation, then the liquid loading problem can be nipped in the bud. We may not have a need to vent the valve right, for unloading purposes. So that is the uh, second area where I see. And then again, failure is failure prediction is low hanging fruit, meaning if we can let our equipment run longer, whether it's ESP or rod pump, that is good. In case of gas lift, we are looking at centralized compression. So how we can keep those trains running. Now here is one more thought there, network optimization, right? The total system optimization. That's where machine learning uh, approaches are also very, very valuable. So what happens when one of your compressor train gets to be taken out of the service? How do you reallocate the? Uh, now, this is not a simple optimization problem. There have been solution out there. And what I have seen is that some of the reinforcement learning based approaches would be very useful. This is uh, my rather quick answer. Great. We've had an Another couple of questions, so I'll go a little bit longer. Um, do you know about any model machine learning or artificial int intelligence for failures prediction in other artificial list systems, such as PCPs, progressive cavity pumps? Uh, I am not aware of any studies that have been performed. That doesn't mean that it has not been done. I'm not aware of it. Uh, typically, whenever you have data available and 
even for PCP, in many cases, we do have intake sensors, we have uh, intake temperature sensor also, we have some torque related measurements, we have speed measurements. So there, and then once the PCP has failed, uh, we can always perform some defog. And using all of this data set, there is no reason why we cannot develop a model for PCP failure prediction. Sounds like a good uh, opportunity. Yes. Uh, one more question. This one is more of a philosophical question. You mentioned subject matter experts versus data science. We've seen workforce turnover. How do you think companies should train their existing subject matter experts in the new machine learning AI literacy, or should they simply hire data scientists, provide in-house Petrotech training for them? Uh, I think uh, what, uh, and, and this is one of the takeaway I gave in my talk uh, earlier, that it is not that we can skill up the subject matter experts to become data scientists. By the way, companies are doing that already. Uh, I think the purpose, or in my opinion, the purpose of that exercise should be that the subject matter expert become comfortable with some of the terminologies that data scientists will use so that they can ask the right questions rather than taking the answers on the face value. That is why it is important that uh, us, the subject matter experts, learn some of this lingo, maybe not become proficient in it. Um, I mean, if you want to, by all means, uh, it should be, but it, it should not be a requirement. Um, and I think uh, that skill set would be also, and it goes back to uh, one of the earlier, uh, the, the very first question that somebody asked about 80% project risk. So when you, have that upscaling, then you can actively participate in the entire cycle and you can reduce the project risk. Excellent. Thank you so much. Those are all the questions we have today. So I'd like to thank our participants for joining us today. Later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and details for how to register for Rajan Choshi's class on artificial lift and real-time optimization for unconventional assets. That's scheduled in Midland, March 7th through 9th, and in Houston, October 10th through 12th. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye.